is just a word salad. And that he doesn't want to get into the mix of it. And what, what I noticed was uh, when, when I was invited down to Northern Arizona State's uh, communications department to speak on the authorial intent of symbolism in art, um, it had dawned on me at that time that there is a certain symptom to uh, professors uh, that, you know, they're walking on eggshells often. And for as much as Professor Anton uh, speaks of, of what it is to be vulnerable, he himself is, is very, very insulated uh, within what it means to read and write and be a part of what he says is book culture. And he's gone through a huge reading list uh, that allows him to gather his ethos and his licensure as professor. And so the, the, the spoof uh, of what it is I'm doing is more or less, uh, it, it's a post-structuralist spoof. If the episteme is the history uh, or is the structuralism, then uh, Levi Strauss, uh, you know, demonstrates the notion of uh, post-structuralism, which moves into relationships. And uh, I, which is kind of funny because in my in my rambling twenty minutes there, I, I almost verbatim cover uh, uh, Derrida, uh, his structure, sign, and play, where he introduces the collapse of the structure. So what I'm doing the the play here is to actually suggest that it is Professor Anton, as much as he uh, makes his sweeping motions uh, to discuss uh, post-structuralistic. Uh, elements of communications and discourse, that the very pathology, the very symptoms of his insulation as a professor kind of define him as a structure, right, like a lot of other professors. And I think that he is entirely blind to the idea that professorship could be a structure itself that is now vulnerable to its own post-structuralism, to its own collapse. Uh, kind of like uh, the professor enjoys Eric Hoffer. Uh, Eric Hoffer uh, uh, write, you know, writes in and moves in laterally is a, is a great read, but he, he's, not, he's not well educated. This is just a perception. He's like a radical outsider that comes rolling in, right? where the professor himself has moved up through the canonized reading list and developed his ethos and his, his background uh, in such a way that it's, it's, it's become uh, kind, of, uh, kind of sheltered and, and there is kind of an ego-based uh, uh, attitude for, uh, you know, as many times as Professor Anton says, oh, I don't know you know, for all I know, et cetera, et cetera, um, he still comes across with a lot of authorial clout that seems to have a little bit of a chip on it. It's a soft chip. It's a round edge, let's say. Not really a chip, but definitely a shoulder to it. And and I sat there and I thought, God, well, what would it mean to generate uh, an antagonism towards um, towards that uh, that systemic chip that professors get, uh, and 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 how could I play into the uh, ironical aspect that the professor himself uh, speaking in terms of relationships would then have to deal with me as a radical coming in sideways and in in and 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 interpreting my words as salad and and and. and having at that point instead of to be being rude or offensive how how to take on this this radical other that I'm I'm trying to propose my personality to be and engage it in a relational sense without having you know in even in his comment in in his video what are all are both of us seen as as rambling word salad that were Charlie Brown's teachers just going wah, 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 as if it would be hugely offensive that he, as a professor of communications, might not actually be able to get across uh, an idea or to think that, boy, I might not be able to get across an idea without the average lay person 
thinking that I sound like Charlie Brown. Well, no, no, no. The whole idea isn't that you don't sound like that, but in as much as you want to, you know, sum up my rambling outline uh, about my read, so to speak, of what it is you've presented already, um, I, I suppose that, that some people might see you as Charlie Brown uh, kind of going wah, wah, wah. Now, um, the, the, the paradox uh, of all of this um, is that um, it, it is kind of a meta-meta linguistics. It's discussing uh, something that I am guilty of to point to something that I believe is not something you're guilty of, but something that's uh, a pathology of, of your profession. I guess to show the manifold of deconstruction, I have to bring up two paradoxes. The virtue of communications opposes the conveyance of communications. That's the first paradox. The virtue of communications is that it assumes an internalized acceptance of all outward forms of human expressions, all multivarious manners and stylistics of human transmissions amongst all of humanity, yet the very vast and extensive nature of all these communications are conveyed through such an inherently constricted, very narrow civil corridor of academic, methodological, politically corrected discourse that the very ideas often come across as flattened and anemic and betray the very vibrant and open tonal qualities that are found uh, in, in unfettered human interaction itself. So the communications paradox lies in one hand and in, in, in this hand we have the personal professional paradox. This is the second paradox now. Corey Anton is the robust man expressing his unique ideas as separate extensions off of lineages of appreciated authors paradoxically butted up against the well-mannered Professor Anton and professional civil practitioner that conveys the benign and well-tempered information to students. Okay, because the topic of the first paradox is content of communications and the subject of the second paradox is the title and entitlement of communications teacher, the second paradox spoons itself nicely into the first paradox, which creates a meta-paradox. And this is the quad part maintenance upheld by Anton. So by openly and robustly expressing myself in a non-apologetic alignment to Anton's expressions, I necessarily associate myself with just the virtue of the human communications being the robustness, while leaving the constriction and the civil discourse untouched. By doing this, I divorce myself from the second part of the first paradox. My divorce, and hence freedom from the first paradox, mirrors Anton's marriage and requirement to that paradox. By conveying content which is critical of the profession of communications from which the entitlement of artists that I take on, that mirrors the disassociation with the well-tempered requirements of professorship while antagonizing Anton's marriage to the inherited protocols of his profession and hence his marriage to the second paradox. So whereby antagonizing just the even sides of this four-part personages that I call Corey Anton, I tempt Corey to violate his professional protocol causing internal rupture in the identification of the man relative to the defense of his profession. If he chases my freedom, this extracts the vulnerable ego uh, insulated within. So what's ironic, what's ironically evidenced in Anton's overt denial that there's anything deconstructive uh, found within my videos is that he himself marries his perception of my communication as unintelligible to his self-consideration that his own personal expression may also be unintelligible. And he wouldn't naturally or logically do that if he wasn't following his mergers mirrored against my divisions. Whether or not he thinks two trailer park girls going around the outside as an outline entirely and completely eclipses the fact that the day destroys the night 
and the night divides the day.